Hi everybody, welcome to Healthline. I am Gregory Zarian. So, the conversation is about you women, yay. It's about OBGYN stuff that I know nothing about. High risk pregnancy, diabetes and pregnancies. There's things that I couldn't even answer, so I decided to bring you the captain of the ship, Dr. Leslie Karostoff from Glendale Adventist Medical Center, and she's going to share with us all we need to know. Hi, Doc. Hi, no pressure. No, for you, for me. <laughs> Apparently, it's on me. <laughs> You're going to be the pilot. I'll be the co-pilot. Okay. So, captain, pilot, I have lots of jobs to we do. We do. I have lots of jobs. I have lots of information to give out there. Okay. All right. So, let's just OBGYN. Yes. What is that? Start with that. <laughs> OBGYN is, in the simplest terms, it's a doctor that takes care of women. Okay. Um, obstetrician, gynecologist, OBGYN became the abbreviation because it was too long to list. Um, we and take I care love, I love abbreviations. Oh, good. I got lots of them. Oh, fantastic. Um, we take care of, of females from, let's say, age 12 to age 90. Okay. Uh, we take care of gynecology. We take care of pregnancy. We get to see sisters, cousins, mothers, best friends. Um, you see people as they go through all transitions of life. Um, I love that about my specialty that I get to do that. I deal with primarily healthy women, um, very exciting times in their lives, and it's fabulous. Um, one of the very special things about my job is taking care of pregnant women. There's no other specialty that gets to take care of pregnant women and deal with the miracle of birth, and it's fabulous. It's my favorite part of my day. What got you involved in the miracle of birth? So I always like being in the operating room. I like the idea of being a surgeon, which I get to do, but I wanted a relationship with my patients, and this way I get to have that I get to to have everything from start to finish with them um, and then pregnancy there's just there's nothing like it um, everybody talks about wanting to be a parent about wanting to have children see there you go but when you start on that journey the journey's not always as straightforward as everybody thinks it's going to be it's not like how you see on television like oh John and Sue right they were in a field and Love is love, and boom, here we have the perfect child. Exactly. There is so much in between Exactly. That. There's 10 months in between that not everybody talks about, and so that's the part that I was attracted to. 10 months. To. We all think... 10 months. Wow. So. Okay, listen, people. So here's the, here's the bring, thing. You all, listen, <laughs> I'm crazy here at Healthline. We think it's nine. Why 10? So it is technically nine months, but you have to complete nine months. So we talk in terms of weeks, and a pregnancy is 40 weeks long, which is the beginning of the 10th month. Wow. So I tell all my patients, if you're counting months, you have to count 10 months, and I get about the reaction that you just gave me. With the hands up and like hands the Hands up. Uh, what do you mean? Okay, listen. You, you know, you can use this trivia at the next party you go to. That's right. 10 months. So 10 months. So backing up a little bit, you were talking about women coming to see or young ladies coming to see from the age of 12 on. Just to, to knock this out of the park. Is that when you suggest that a young woman should come see a uh, no, we really only see teenagers and, and pre-teenagers if they're having problems. Okay. Routine care usually starts <laughs> somewhere between 18 and 21. 18 and 21. Um, and what is the age that you suggest that a young lady should start seeing a gynecologist? Um, it depends on other things that are going on in their okay. lives. Um, the safest thing to recommend, so it's not too personal or too intimate for a 17-year-old or 18-year-old, I love to tell the patients to come before they go to college. That's fantastic. It's a wonderful time to come. You can talk about birth control. You can talk about all the preventive stuff before they reach those milestones. I love that. So we're going to address all of that. So you know what? Since I changed your life and I told you pregnancy is 10 months, take a deep breath in and a deep breath out. More with Dr. Karostoff and what you ladies need to know about high-risk pregnancy, diabetes, and more female stuff when we come back. Don't go away. Welcome back to Healthline. The entire conversation today is about you ladies and pregnancy, and I know this much about it. Joining us from Glendale Adventist Medical Center is OBGYN specialist, Dr. Leslie Karostoff. I get to call her Dr. K. Hi, Doc. <laughs> Hi. Okay, I wanna, we're going to talk about high-risk pregnancies and things we need to learn, but real quickly, I just want you to address um, young ladies and waiting in regards to being sexual in activity. How important is that? Um, you know, there's a lot of discussion now about um, HPV, you like the abbreviations, the human papillomavirus, um, and the vaccinations, and the exposure, and it's only transmitted sexually. So the, you know, young ladies have been encouraged to wait. Um, but if they're not waiting, they've also been encouraged to be educated about it. So that's one of the things that we do is I we make that. sure that they're educated early. The pediatricians are educating, we're educating, um, you know, whatever level you think that the adolescents are going to be receptive to it. Um, you and know, 
one, th one thing I do want to throw on there too, though, is is don't be afraid to talk to your parents. Right. Because here's the thing. Your parents have already been there. If you're here, your parents have been there. So talk to them. Because even as people get older and they're afraid to talk about, you know, men are so infamous for not talking about, you know, this hurt or that hurt, this doesn't work. Have a conversation because talking about it will help you and possibly save your life if something doesn't, if something does happen. I think that's really important. And I try and do a little of both of that. Most of the time, if I get a teenager coming in there with their mother, um, and what I do is I bring them both in I together, I and I encourage that. That, they, that they should share with their mother. I then ask the mothers to leave, and I reassure this teenager, this 16-year-old, this 17-year-old who's panicked, that she and I now have a relationship that I can't share information that she doesn't agree that I share. So it's something the three of us can talk together, or she can talk to her mom, or she can talk to me privately. And then I reassure them that it's a safe place for them, because we're talking about things that are scary to 16-year-olds. And we're talking about things that are important to know. Right, and they're gonna be important, you know, for, for her life. Love that. Uh, do you talk to boys at all? Um, occasionally. Okay, good. Occasionally, especially teenagers. Um, usually in a situation um, that there's been a pregnancy that was a surprise, um, and the fathers come in and they're panicked, and we address what happened, and immediately I address how we're going to prevent it from happening again. I love that. So yeah, that's what I do. But otherwise, I don't. I don't see the see the boys that much. So boys, bottom line, be gentlemen. Thank you. We're here to talk about high-risk pregnancy. What is that, Doc? High-risk pregnancy is something that is a giant category, um, and it's become a little bit of a misnomer. There are lots of reasons people may think they have a high-risk pregnancy or may be perceived as having a high-risk pregnancy, but there's a specific group that really is high risk. So let's talk about the ones that's not specific yet. What are the ones where people think, oh my God, it's a high risk? What are some of those signs and symptoms? So one of the things that we've seen as a change in our society is that women work. Okay. Women are not always at home. Which is great. Which is wonderful. Um, gives you independence, gives you lots of things. That being said, it's become a little bit more of a trend for women to have children later. Okay. A first child, second child, third child, whatever it is. A high risk patient used to be considered anybody over the age of 35 called Advanced Maternal Age, or AMA. Um, and that's something that's really gone a little bit by the wayside because it's we've changed seen a lot, it's changed it? a lot. And that women in their late 30s, even early 40s, can have perfectly healthy pregnancies with the right care. So that's something that I think's become less of a high risk um, definition. In regards to women, what is the oldest, in your experience, that a woman could get pregnant and, and, and have a healthy child? Because so, we hear people in their 50s, 52s, even something I saw like 60s. There are. There are. In our world of technology, you have to talk about a natural pregnancy. Okay. The oldest woman that I've seen that got pregnant the old-fashioned way was 48 years old. Okay. When you start to talk about all the technology and in vitro fertilization and fertility, which is a whole nother show. Um, oh, having you back on that. Okay, great. I'll be back. Thank you. Um, those women can be in their 50s. Okay. Um, but then you get into the issue of those eggs are older eggs. Got it. More risk of chromosomal abnormalities. Got it. And so then a lot of those women are using egg donors and we get into a whole nother whole nother topic. That's a whole different topic. Whole nother okay, topic. so women can be working moms from the age of uh, past 40 and have a healthy pregnancy. Right, they can work the whole Great. way through their pregnancy. Just because they're 40 doesn't mean that they're going to be on bed rest because they're high risk. It, you know, if they have no medical problems, if they have no history of any problems, then to me it's a normal pregnancy. Well, I don't consider that just be healthy risk. though. Exactly. Lots of exercise, a healthy diet, mm -hmm. don't do too much drinking, just really just stay healthy and that will be a healthy at 40 on. Well, and I, I also, you know, having done this for as many years as I've done this, there are also women that are 40 that are scared because they're too old. Which I hear that a lot. Of course, but think about women in their 40s when you refer to stress. A 40-year-old who has a stable job, who's been married for years, who's comfortable with herself and her world, has a lot less stress than a 20-year-old who doesn't know what she's doing. And she has no idea what tomorrow looks like. Right. Right. Okay, so are you hearing that, 40-year-olds? You are good and ready to have a child. <laughs> and again, wait for that gentleman. Now, back to that smaller... High risk. High risk. Um, what is that? So high risk has evolved as a specialty. Um, there used to be people who did fellowships for another four years beyond what we all specialized to take care of high risk pregnancies. They now serve as consultants. And okay. so the bulk of taking care of high risk pregnant women and delivering them has fallen to what we call the general OBGYN, okay. which is me. 
Um, so high risk pregnancies are women, um, and we'll go broad categories and then you can pick whatever you want to look at. Um, women who've had multiple miscarriages, who've had a hard time getting pregnant and now we need to sustain a pregnancy. Women who have medical conditions who maybe never dreamed of getting pregnant. Um, a diabetic that you refer to, a poorly controlled diabetic that's on an insulin pump whose sugar changes throughout the whole day, never dreamed that she'd be pregnant. They get pregnant and we have to know how to manage them. Women with high blood pressure, uh, women pregnant with three babies, two babies. Um, because the concern is not so much about the mother, but it's also about, and it's also about the child that right. the woman carries. And that's what I tell everybody when they're pregnant is now I no longer have one patient. You know, my patient I've followed for 10 years, now I have two. As long as the mother's pregnant, I have two people that I need to take care of. Once the babies come out, I know nothing, and I tell my patients that. But until that baby's delivered, I have two people that I'm responsible for. Talk to us about multiple miscarriages. What is that? Multiple miscarriages, there are lots of reasons, and nobody entirely understands why. Some of the reasons are medical, some are environmental. Um, there are miscarriages that usually happen early on. Um, between six and eight weeks, so it's just enough time to be excited that you got pregnant, but not enough time to get used to the idea got or be it. able to do anything about it. Um, some women have medical disorders. Um, they have something, um, an inherited clotting disorder uh, that's usually found um, as a fluke, or if you've had recurrent miscarriages, then we do a whole um, panel that we, we do a workup to see if the mother has anything that would be, um, for lack of a better word, attacking the baby. Got it. Um, and so that's usually a common thing. A, an easier thing is if your hormone levels are imbalanced, usually okay. a progesterone level. Um, the best way to describe early pregnancy is a bridge. Your ovary secretes um, progesterone until the placenta is ready to take over and secrete progesterone. And now I'm saying words that you're like, right? I've heard of them. Um, so your ovary is supposed to secrete it until your placenta is secreting enough. Okay. You can imagine if at one point, if this bridge, if the ovary stops secreting the placenta, uh, sorry, the progesterone and the placenta is not ready, the bridge collapses and you lose the pregnancy. Got it. So a really easy way to do that is to supplement progesterone in, in the next pregnancy. And so we can do tests on the mother, and then I can reassure them with the next pregnancy that we can try and prevent a miscarriage. That's a lot. Did I lose Are you? there No, not at all. Are there any signs and symptoms to, to what you just talked about that no. someone should look for? No. Nope. That's the thing, and that's why I always encourage women to come in after having a miscarriage so we can talk about if they have any medical things. Um, they worry that they caused the miscarriage from not wanting to be pregnant and having bad thoughts or something like that. Let me like ask that. you a question. Can't Is it not at all? Any no. of that valid at all? No. I usually tell women the only way that you could cause <clears throat> yourself to have a miscarriage is to try and mechanically cause yourself to have a miscarriage. But your thoughts don't mean... No. Nope. Interesting. We're gonna and they beat themselves up about it. Wow. So... For all of you that feel that you've caused something to happen with you and your body, ladies, not so much. We're going to talk about high-risk pregnancy and diabetes when we come back with Dr. K. As I always have you do, take a deep breath in because a lot of times you forget to breathe. Breathe in and breathe out. Get a glass of water. We'll see you on the other side of this break. Welcome back to Healthline. The conversation's all about high-risk pregnancy. Joining us is Dr. K from Glendale Adventist Medical Center. And here's, I, I don't even know if it's an urban myth, doctor. Uh, women believe that if, if they have a child after the age of 40, the child's not going to be normal, that there may be something wrong with it. Is that, that's, a, that's an urban myth. It's not entirely an urban myth. Oh, it's not? It's not. It's been blown out of proportion to become more of an urban legend myth. Okay. Um, but as women, anybody over the age of 35 does have increased risk of abnormalities. So when you say abnormalities, what is that? What are those? Um, most people would be worried about chromosomal problems, Down syndrome, okay. um, other abnormal chromosomes, um, things that aren't compatible with life, okay. um, or children that are going to need extra help, special, extra special. support, special needs. Um, so one of the things, as we talked about earlier, technology and all the things that we do to make people more comfortable um, is there are fields that focus just on the genetic testing of high-risk pregnancies or women that are older that are pregnant because we've already separated those two. Um, it used to only be the gold standard was something called an amniocentesis, which scared a lot of women. It's a long needle in the belly. And Where you pull out? where you pull out some fluid. fluid. Right, exactly. So it's a test that's specific for that woman and that pregnancy and not a screening test. Okay. Um, and it, so that was something that then we could examine the cells and reassure the woman it was a normal pregnancy and not normal pregnancy. 
Um, there are lots of women now that have evolved into wanting non-invasive testing. The concept of a needle bothered them. Um, and with are, you, the, are you pro or con, or is it dependent on the patient themselves? It's dependent on the patient themselves. Um, I always tell the patients, it's information that I can give you, but it depends on what you would do with that information. If it would change how you feel about the pregnancy, then it's something that you need. Okay. If it's a preparation for you to be able to prepare for the pregnancy, then it's something that you need. It's not required, it's optional. Okay. It's informational gathering for the, for the patient and her partner. So you're supportive though of information then? Absolutely. Okay. I think the more information that you have, then the better decisions that you can make. Okay, continue. Um, so we tried to, um, there were certain women that didn't want anything invasive. Although the amniocentesis gave you great information, there was a slight risk of a miscarriage. Okay. So women who were 40, who had had a hard time getting pregnant, who are now pregnant, the thought of taking any risk to them was unacceptable. Got it. So there are tests that were developed called NIPT. I know how you like your letters. I do. Uh, Non-invasive prenatal testing. Got it. And these are blood tests that are being tested now and used that are almost as good as an amniocentesis. Not quite, but it gives us We're the same enough, information. Though. And very early on, it gives us the same information at about nine or 10 weeks, maybe before you've already shared that information with people that you were pregnant, so that you can get that information if maybe it's not a normal pregnancy. Do you suggest that people wait till after that nine, 10 weeks to let people know they're pregnant? One of, yes. One so of it's the like a holding, it's a holding, that, a holding pattern. Once you get to 11 weeks, your risk of miscarriage is less than 5%. Okay. So that's how that whole first trimester, don't tell anyone, evolved. 25% um, of all pregnancies end in a miscarriage. Nobody talks about that, but that's a fourth of all pregnancies. So as you get a little bit further along, your risk goes down. And so then it's just, it's more comfortable for people to not share it. In regards to amniocentesis and the NI... NIPT. NIPT. Are there any other types of tests that can be done? There are. Which then makes us look at, as you were saying earlier, the genetic there world are. a lot broader. There are. We have a whole panel of testing. There are state mandated tests that do first trimester, second trimester, okay. looking at the whole thing. And then there are the more detailed tests, the NIPT, amniocentesis, all those things when you put it together, we're really able to give patients that want all that information as much information as we're able to. Let's back up now to what I talked a little bit about earlier is um, high-risk pregnancies and diabetes. Diabetes. Diabetes is a condition that many people deal with, pregnant, not pregnant, um, tremendous family history with it. We have two types of diabetics that we deal with in pregnancy. One is called a gestational diabetic, um, and women are sometimes... I, I know a few... Uh, my godson, Owen, his mother... Uh, had gestational diabetes. But then not diabetes when she wasn't pregnant. Then gone. Like, right. So you have it you During have the it, gestation. You have it for the 10 months. Exactly. And then it goes away. Exactly. Don't mess with me, people. Because there are no <laughs> symptoms okay. in her situation, everybody is screened for gestational diabetes. Um, at around 20, between 24 and 28 weeks, um, everybody does a test. You go and you drink this very sweet, sugary stuff, and we draw some blood to see how your body handles sugar. Um, if that's abnormal, we do what's called a three-hour test, which is a nightmare for most women. It's lots of blood, and you're not eating for hours. Um, if those women test positive, then they're gestational diabetics. Got it. Usually diet-controlled. Sometimes they need medication. Otherwise, we manage the pregnancy pretty similarly to a normal pregnancy. The more complicated diabetic pregnancy, pregnant women can't talk are the ones who were diabetic before they became pregnant. So this puts us in a whole nother category that pregnancy can affect their blood sugars, which were a problem to begin with. Okay. So these are women that are aware of their diagnosis, that already have a primary care doctor or an endocrinologist that manages their blood sugars. So then I work in conjunction with those doctors so to make sure that they're, right, team approach, to make sure that those women, that the blood sugar stay as controlled as possible um, so that it doesn't affect the baby, like we talked about having two patients. Um, but I have women that their blood sugars could be all over the place and we just watch them very carefully, um, sometimes maybe seeing them more often, adjusting their medication, and they have perfectly healthy pregnancies and perfectly healthy babies. Are there anything about high-risk pregnancies that you feel that we also need to know? Just that any woman who's considering pregnancy who has a medical condition or is concerned that she's high risk or somebody has told her that she's high risk, we offer what we call preconceptual counseling to anybody. I love that. I love and that. And they I can come that. in and they can tell me what they're worried about. Can what it be their medical even before somebody's are. pregnant? That, no, that's what it is. Okay, great, 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 great. Okay. I've had women that come in and bring me a list of their medications because there are some they can stay on pregnant and some we have to change. Because like you, some women say, oh, I can't have fish. 
I can't have this. It, is that that's just to take, make sure the pregnancy is solid and strong. Right. What is the whole thing with fish and pregnancy? Fish is, uh, that's levels of mercury. Okay. And a little bit of an urban myth, and there are really only four kinds of fish to avoid, and most people don't eat them. What are they? Shark. Oh, I love, I, I love shark. Okay, <laughs> Tile shark. fish. Okay, I don't even know what that King is. King mackerel. I have no idea. Swordfish is the only one. Wow. So I tell my patients, salmon, tilapia, shrimp, great, have at it. Just okay. make sure it's cooked, no raw sushi. What is your suggestion in regards to having the healthiest pregnancy? The healthiest pregnancy um, is not trying to do something that you didn't do before you were pregnant. What does that mean? If you never exercised before you got pregnant, it's not the time to start an exercise regimen. Most women do that though, don't they? Most women do that. You will find that women, as soon as they find out they were pregnant, I did this. My shopping cart at the supermarket, healthiest food I've ever bought in my life. It lasted about a month. <laughs> um, and I bet the homo hormones were fun too. Yeah. Fantastic. Um, the, you know, women that are considering getting pregnant, that's a good time, again, in the preconceptual counseling, to start a little bit of an exercise regimen that you'll be able to continue. Starting boot camp two months before you get pregnant, you're not going to be able to continue that. But starting um, swimming, starting yoga, things like that that you can continue are wonderful ideas. Um, you shouldn't be drinking, you shouldn't be smoking, you know, all those things. Another urban myth is oh, I can have a glass of wine. True or not? <sighs> it depends on the doctor. Okay. When we talk about the effect of alcohol on a baby and fetal alcohol syndrome, you're talking about a huge volume of alcohol over a long period of time. Got it. The story I like to tell people is, is think of all those people who get pregnant on their honeymoon. They were probably not sober a day on their honeymoon and those babies only have one head. Wow. Give it up for Urban Mets. <laughs> we will do a wrap out with Dr. K and just a few more things you need to know about high-risk pregnancies. And ladies, I'll say it again. Make sure the guy's a gentleman. Don't go away. Thank you for sticking with us on this conversation all about women and OBGYN. Joining us is rock star from Glenda Adventist Medical Center, Dr. Leslie Karostoff. I get to call her Dr. K. Doc, we have talked about teens, younger women. We've talked about high risk. There's a whole different spectrum to women in life, and it's over 50. What do they need to look out for? There's, um, there's another, a whole, uh, that's probably a whole other show so as well. So you're coming back twice. Coming back twice. Fantastic. Um, women over 50 have different needs, different focuses, different uh, transitions in their life, like we talked about the adolescence. And one of the things, like I said at the beginning, that I love is I get to take care of women of all ages. I like that you use the word transition as well. So they're, they have different things that they're going through, and we're trained to do it. And, and I find as I get older, which we're not really going to talk about, but I go through those transitions with my patients. And so it's something that I try and help share and help them go through the things that they're going through. Um, and so for the older women, we make sure that they're getting their regular mammograms. Even if they don't need a regular pap smear, they should still come in yearly just to check in. Just to love check that. in. I How are that. they emotionally, physically? Are there changes that they haven't spoken to anybody about or changes that they thought they were going crazy that are actually perfectly normal? Because women talk a lot about the change and the, and the hot flashes and all that. Right. What, what is your one thought about women in menopause and the change? What so my one thought is it has to be a totally personal thing for okay. each patient that estrogen is not evil and sometimes estrogen will <laughs> fix a lot of things that, that women are going through, um, but that it's not for everybody. Okay. So I have a discussion, yes hormones, no hormones, and it's completely personally tailored to that patient that. and what they're going through. And if a woman is, when, when does uh, menopause start? Average age is 50. Okay, 50. But it can be earlier. We That's have women called peri perimenopausal? Perimenopausal. Good job! Right? That's because of you. Okay. Um, we do have some women very rarely in their 30s, and we have some women in their late 50s. Okay. But most women between 48 and 52, 53 is when we're going to see. Are there that. also holistic approaches to transitioning through menopause for women as well? There are. There are. Okay. I use holistic approaches with that, that and also taking this back to pregnancy. I also use some of the holistic approaches in pregnancy like acupuncture and chiropractor um, and incorporate all that um, and make it just a, a whole body approach. Dr. K, uh, final thought in regards to women and their health. What are your final thoughts? I think um, we talk a lot about preventative care that don't wait to be sick to go to the doctor. Can you say that again? I'm looking don't at the camera. Don't wait to be sick to go to the doctor. Thank you. That would be my best take home message. I should just stop there. In regards to, real quickly, um, health and wellness, what, what, do you, what is suggested? Uh, 
Great um, health and wellness for women. So women should see an OBGYN annually. Um, starting every, at what age? Starting at, let's say, at 18, unless they're having problems. Okay, and a little bit younger, it's a conversation with the family doctor. Exactly. And from, eight, from, from like 17, 18 up till All once the way a year. through. Um, we stop doing pap smears regularly at 70, okay. but I still encourage my patients to come in again just to check in once a year, make sure everything's okay. And what do you Plus, say? I like seeing them. Because you're part of that because I'm part the of transition. That. Yeah. Uh, what is your thought to boys? Anything you want to say to us guys? Probably the same thing. Be gentlemen. And continue to be gentlemen, exactly. Thank you. Well, I am a gentleman. Uh, so you heard it right here. Ladies, don't take your health into your hands. From the age of 17 up, make sure you see an OBGYN. Have a conversation with your parents. Don't do it alone. And one thing that I want to enforce again, if you are pregnant and you don't want to have the child, have a conversation with your parent, with your doctor. It's not your fault if something works or doesn't work. You don't have that much power. Remember, the most important conversation you or someone you love is going to be about you and their health. So make sure you have one today. We will see you next time. Have a great week. Thanks.